Oh, I hit okay. that. Okay. Yeah, they're um, good. You hit it? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm ready? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Human Trafficking Hiding in Plain Sight. Please let us know in the chat box if you have any questions during the training, and I'll try to get to them at the end or um, during. And also, if you have any issues hearing me, you know, please put that in the chat box or let me know if you can't hear. Uh, my name is Kathy Peluso, and I work at Family Services as the Sexual Assault Response Team Coordinator. I would like to give credit to Courtney Albert, who is the creator of this training. She is also the founder and president of Give Way to Freedom, which is a nonprofit organization based out of Vermont, um, where they fight trafficking and uh, fundraise for trafficking victims. So this is a little overview of what we're going to be talking about, uh, defining human trafficking, facts and statistics, some red flags and indicators to recognize trafficking, um, the totality of the victim's experience and some case examples, and what we have in Dutchess County as a response to trafficking. So does anybody want to comment about this? slide and um, what you think it means. Do not see any chat box, so I'm not able to really see this. Cheryl, anything coming in? Hey, Kathy. Um, yeah. So somebody wrote like how much a person is worth somebody else wrote people are bought and sold thank you perfect uh thanks jenna yeah uh, yeah first and foremost trafficking is a human rights issue it robs people of their dignity and basic human rights it exploits people and their dreams and hopes for a better future so human trafficking exploits men women children by forcing them to work unbearably long hours under inhumane conditions for little or no pay. It exploits the most vulnerable, of course. And it's a huge criminal enterprise that makes approximately $150 billion per year globally. It's also a public health issue. If you consider the working conditions and living conditions, sex trafficking, for instance, consider the number of clients, Johns not being able to use protection, and of course, it's also an issue of child abuse when talking about anybody who's under the age of 18. Hey, um, I want to talk about intersectionality and how it intersects with other different uh, forms of abuse and crimes. It's not a silo phenomena. It intersects with many other issues faced in our country. And many of these issues are what makes people vulnerable to trafficking. So substance abuse, community violence, very closely related to intimate partner violence. Sometimes it's hard to recognize trafficking because of this intersectionality. Immigration, child abuse. So this is the United States federal definition the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through use of force, fraud, or coercion. You're gonna hear those words a lot during this training. For the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And sex trafficking is defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, advertising, patronizing, soliciting of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex. <clears throat> so, um, the difference between slavery and involuntary servitude uh, to remember is that slavery status will match for life, but involuntary servitude is for only a definite period of time. And peonage and debt bondage are very similar to each other, where somebody is, um, you know, in debt because they are paying off their trafficker, and it's really almost impossible to ever get those debts paid. 
So that's how the trafficking continues. But we'll talk more about that as we go on. There are three populations, minors under age 18, involved in commercial sex. And the important thing to remember is anybody under the age of 18 is too young to consent to commercial sex and therefore forced fraud and coercion do not need to be proven. There is no such thing also as an underage prostitute, which you see a lot in the media when they talk about underage uh, children as being underage pro prostitutes where it's, they cannot be underage prostitutes. It's illegal and it's uh, trafficking. So those over 18 are involved in commercial sex before force, fraud or coercion and children and adults forced to perform labor or services um, in, of involuntary servitude, P&H, debt bondage and slavery by a force, fraud or coercion. I told you we're gonna hear those words a lot during this training. Kathy, what's peonage? Peonage is, um, you know, it's interesting that you're asking me this because that was the question I asked when I went to this training. It's very similar to debt bondage. In fact, I'm not really even sure what the difference is. Um, when you look up the word peonage, it pretty much describes it the same as debt slavery or debt servitude, where they're paying off um, some kind of a debt. You know, they may be brought over to our country or, or somewhere where it starts off as, um, you know, a real job or they think it's a real job, but then they're added on, they have extra um, debts added on, like food and transportation, and they can never actually pay off that debt. So this is the AMP model where in order for it to be trafficking, there has to be an action, a means, a purpose. So number one, the action, how did that person get into that situation? And here's a, you know, a few of the different ways they can get into it. A means, here we go, force, fraud, or coercion. How were they kept in the situation? And in order for it to be trafficking, you need to have either force, fraud, or coercion. And sometimes it's all three. Purpose. What purpose was the person brought in and kept in the situation? And the last one, I believe, was um, an underage. I have to look back on that because it was blocked. Excuse me. Yes, yeah, so that's underage 18 for the purpose of commercial sex. So under age 18, like I said before, they're too young to consent to commercial sex and it doesn't need to be proven. And So both federal, um, I want to go back to the uh, AMP for a second, both federal and state use the AMP model. It's a nice summary. Uh, it pulls the two laws together. So you need an action, a means, and a purpose. Uh, trafficking in person, human trafficking or umbrella terms for activities involved when someone obtains or holds a person in compelled service. So under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, TVPA, individuals may be trafficking victims regardless of whether one, they once consented, participated in a crime as a re direct result of being trafficked, or were transported into the exploitive situation in the beginning, or were simply born into a state of servitude. So on this slide, it's um, the key and the means. So force is pretty obvious. Um, physical, sexual assault, rape, confinement, kidnapping, facilitated drug use. Fraud is the one that is easier to conceal, often overlooked. Withholding of wages, fraudulent uh, employment contracts, or promises, and coercion also. Threats to self, threats to pets, threats of arrest, deportation, blackmail, debt bondage, we talked about again, withholding of legal documents and other psychological um, 
means of manipulation and control. Whoops, excuse my dog is barking. Okay. Hopefully that stops. It's the mailman again. Okay. Um, the term coercion um, is going to come up a lot. We're going to see that a lot in um, how somebody gets into trafficking and stays in it. Okay, now this is not moving. I'm sorry, my screen seems to be frozen for a minute. There you go. So New York Safe Harbor for Exploited Youth Act. Um, so it recognizes that's a child welfare issue, not a criminal justice issue. Any person under 18 years of age who have been subject to sexual exploitation um, or offered to exchange sexual conduct in return for food, clothing, a place to stay, drugs, or a fee. So there's three ways, uh, diversion, treated trafficking victims, individuals as victims, not criminals by protecting them from execution, criminal records and criminal penalties. It's like in the case of somebody uh, being arrested for prostitution instead of uh, actually you know, being the victim of the crime. Services, they provide safe housing and appropriate services along with seeking monetary compensation in the form of restitution and protection. Protect the identity and personal information of the victims and court proceeding protections. So here's a list of the different um, areas, stripping, exotic dancing or performing, where they used uh, children, pornography, prostitution, survival sex or transactional sex for food. I'm having uh, issues with my computer here. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm trying to move it along and it's hesitating. <clears throat> so here's um, under age 18, there's survival sex. So uh, young people might use survival sex. So sex in exchange for basic needs, food, uh, shelter, common for runaways, and third party controlled, where somebody else is controlling and facilitating the involvement. It may be violent or it may not be violent. Here's a look at some of the labor tra uh, trafficking venues where you can see it, domestic work, construction, manufacturing, agriculture is very big restaurants, food service, hospitality, hair and nail salons. I was at a training recently where, where um, they were talking about uh, young children working in places like, if you ever go into maybe a Chinese fast food place and you see a young child working, many times we don't even think twice about that, you know, um, and it's right in front of us where we just think, oh, well, it's a cultural thing and they're working with the family, but it really is illegal for a child to be working. So it's important also with this slide to understand that it's, it's everywhere <clears throat> and it's happening in all different locations, including in residential communities. Here's some other places, massage parlors, we hear about a lot, bars and strip clubs. So it was an international sex trafficking ring in 2013. Human trafficking victims are men, women, and children. A lot of times we only hear about women, young female victims 
victims. So the key to trafficking is vulnerability. Um, here's an example of the federal crackdown in Queens. It was a trafficking ring, but there was a house in Poughkeepsie uh, which was connected with this. And that was in 2013. And you know, it's right in the city of Poughkeepsie. So it's everywhere. So international, domestic, there's no movement necessary for trafficking to take place. Don't have to be moved from one place to another. Person can be trafficked without ever needing to leave the city. They might have been born in Poughkeepsie and trafficked in Poughkeepsie. Many people think it comes, you know, trafficking because of the word. I think it sounds like there's movement involved. So it's very confusing. So here's one of the cases, um, and just highlighting this that, you know, to for everyone to understand that it happens right here, right around uh, Dutchess County and, you know, all over New York State, all over different states throughout the um, United States. Different country of origins, as you can see. The majority of human trafficking clients came from the United States, Central and South America and Asia. US is a, a source country, transit country, and a destination country for all three. So here's the difference between human trafficking and smuggling. Human trafficking is a crime against a person. This is an important way to remember it, where Human smuggling is a crime against a border. Human trafficking is exploitation based, no movement required. There's elements of coercion and people are seldom aware of the entire process, even if they originally consented to it. Where smuggling is usually transportation based, it requires crossing a border. There's no coercion involved many times. And they're usually aware of their um, the conditions of the travel, they voluntarily engage and maybe not realizing that it can turn into trafficking once they're here. So example, someone smuggled into a country, once they're here, the trafficker tells them, you have to work to pay me back for the transportation, and then they are trafficked. Um, so it can turn into, smuggling can turn into trafficking. Okay, so it's estimated there are over 40 million victims of human trafficking globally, as this slide shows you. 71% women and girls, 50% forced labor, and children, 25%. Here's um, just a little graph showing you what it looks like. I'm go going to go through these graphs rather quickly, but we can go back if you want to look at them closely. So here's a difference in males and female victims. Males are more likely to be in manufacturing, agriculture, construction, et cetera. Females more likely to be food service, domestic work, accommodations, hotels. The study in uh, 2016, it shows here, the first experience trading sex took place while under the age of 18. The average age, 15.8. Almost 73% had left home under the age of 18, many runaways, and 32% had their first sexual experience before the age of 13. <clears throat> Kathy, there's a question in the chat. Go ahead. Will we get some follow-up materials with the data and other important points? Uh, I can do that, yes. I can send the PowerPoint if you'd like.
Was that the only question? It said thank you. Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can send that. Sending the PowerPoint would be great. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I put my email at the end of this, but I'll give it to you at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Here's some more uh, important points about youth trafficking. More likely to be sexually exploited by family or friends in the U.S. for monetary gain. Recruited for economic need, the family and peer encouragement. They're trafficked by their own family. And between 50 and 80% of child tra sex trafficking victims have had contact with the child welfare system. <clears throat> Many in foster homes, runaways, like I said. 2007, 2,652 child trafficking victims statewide. Here's some stats on uh, Dutchess County human trafficking referrals, which came in. And 2015 is the year that the, um, you know, funding was given to the county for youth trafficking in the Safe Harbor program. So it started out slowly, but you know, more and more people were educated on how to recognize the red flags. As you can see, as time went on, the referrals went up. I don't have a um, number for 2020 right now, and. Uh, the county, you know, funds the program themselves right now. So it looks like 34 was the last um, number that we had. And of course, there's many, many more that, you know, we don't find out about, but this is what um, came forward into the uh, trafficking task force in Dutchess County. Some more statistics, 28 were female, male were six, LGBTQ five, heterosexual 29. And here's the ages, <clears throat> 14 were 12 to 15 and 19 were 16 to 18. Seven adult referrals in 2018 and six adult referrals as of September 30th. So, Many times when uh, trafficking is recognized, um, even in the rape crisis program at the Center for Victim Safety and Support, uh, those people don't always want to report, they don't stick around, um, you know, they become transient, they leave the area, and it's, it's hard to keep in touch with them. So it's not always easy to uh, work with trafficking victims. Many times they don't have the trust and they leave. Um, and we've had a few of those um, occur in our program. So some indicators and red flags. Okay, <clears throat> so misleading information, the person's in debt, like we said earlier. Uh, somebody, a third party, arranged travel, work documents, passport documentation were confiscated. Can you imagine being in a different country and everything's confiscated and you don't have any contact with anyone from the outside? They have none or fewer personal belongings. They're inappropriately dressed for the weather. Um, you know, if you see one of these, it doesn't necessarily mean it's trafficking. There has to be more questions asked and you know, some trust gained with that person to find out more information. Many people don't really know that they're being trafficked. Signs of abuse, signs of fear, gaps in the story, they lost a sense of time, or, or even, you know, sometimes they don't know the area that they're living in. Some other freedom of movement and living conditions. When a third party insists on being present for conversations, we always try to separate people when that happens anyway. Um, you know, many times in domestic violence, you know, somebody comes in with somebody at the hospital and they always want to separate people so they can talk to them per, um, alone. That third one where they, they don't know where they are, doesn't know what city they live in, that's a red flag. 
working conditions. They weren't originally recruited for doing certain things. And then everything is added on, different um, tasks are added on to work hours, more hours are added on. No wages were taken from them for payment of other things like the debts. I think I got my thing to work again. Um, here's some indicators of domestic minor sex trafficking. And of course, one of these doesn't always mean, you know, that person's being trafficked, obviously. Many young children have, you know, tattoos. Um, but, you know, you start seeing a few of these together, you know, raises some red flags. Older boyfriend, close companion, and it doesn't have to be a male. New unexplained possessions. I always like that one, excessive, almost pathological attachment to their cell phone. I feel like many young people have that. So we can't go by that one alone. Disconnection from social supports. Age inappropriate sexual behavior or sexually transmitted infections. Working more than in school. So in order to understand, we want to understand the totality of the victim's experience. We, we need to understand what the backstory is. What got them into this, the recruitment stage? How did that happen? What were their vulnerabilities? Vulnerabilities um, is what a trafficker looks for. They look for that kid who ran away from home, who's not being accepted by their family. Other victimizations that they've had in the past. What other victimizations? They may have been sexually abused at home, not always, but uh, many of them are, and which is why they left and ran away. And that person sees that vulnerability in them and plays on that. <clears throat> what were their experiences while they were being trafficked? <clears throat> Was force used? Was fraud, coercion? And how were they maintained? Impacts and consequences. <clears throat> so there's the maintenance stages and exit stages. How did they get out of it? Which brings us to the backstory. There's um, individual backstory, interpersonal, community backstory, societal. <clears throat> so in other words, it's it's not only what happened to them while they were trafficked, but what happened to them before they were trafficked, basically. So here's a Utica ring. It's um it was a 16-year-old runaway girl. It was February in Utica, New York. She meets a cab driver who tells her he will help her, but the cab driver then passed her off to two others who became her primary trafficker. Okay. Pain and heroin was introduced. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Advertised her online and through texting. Other individuals either drove or provided drugs. The Utica cab driver picked up the girl introduced into prostitution ring based in Utica, forced her to have sex with money and only agreed to a place. She resisted the prostitution at one point at a Super 8 hotel in, in uh, Utica. Another prostitute held her down. Well, you shouldn't say another prostitute because she wasn't a prostitute. Held her down and injected her with something she described as heroin, but better. This knocked the girl into a sleepy daze. She soon performed a sexual act on one man in exchange for $60. So. In looking at this case, does anybody want to um, put in the chat box of uh, what were the vulnerabilities of this woman? So we have a couple of comments in the in the chat box. Um, one is, please offer this to attendance officers, guidance counselors, principals, school nurses, even teachers and TAs in the county. Yes, um, that is happening. Yeah. By the way, 
Jenna is asking, can you give an example of a backstory? And then we have a comment. We can't hear you when you move your head away from the screen. Somehow you get away oh, from the mic. So if you can. Um, and so your question was about the vulnerabilities here. Is that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I was asking what, what were her vulnerabilities in this um, situation? Think about it. Runaway 16 year old girl and um, Does anybody remember what month I said it was when she was picked up? February? Yes. What's the weather like in February? She needed a place to stay. It was cold. It's winter. She was only a, a kid. Yeah, cold snow, ice, it's Utica, right? Ugh. Yes. Very cool. And then, you know, what kind of factors kept her in it? Well, she was physically restrained at one point. Nowhere else to right. go, Jenna says. Exactly. And also there were drugs introduced. Threats, violence. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the cocaine and heroin was introduced to keep her dependent and in control. So these are the, all the people that were involved in this situation here. So all of these have push factors, how they get into it, and then pull factors. So here are some push factors. I mean, we're going to talk about some other cases and, and um, if you want to, you know, keep all of these in mind when we start talking about them, about how that person got into it and how they were kept in it. So individual push factors. History of child abuse, foster care, desire for material comforts. Many young people think that if they get into um, prostitution, they're going to make a lot of money, but that usually isn't the case. All of these are the push factors, individual push factors. <clears throat> Interpersonal, trying to help their family, peer influences, gang involvement. They want to please the boyfriends, who they think their boyfriends are. Many times these kids come, um, you know, and when they're getting help from services, they believe that person, you know, really cares about them, the trafficker, and they're bonded to them. So it's very difficult sometimes to, you know, gain that trust and help them understand that they were being trafficked. Some community and societal. Like I said earlier, glorification of pimp culture, the internet, social media. And some pull factors. These are the promises. Offering of love and affection. That's a big one, especially for these kids who grow up and they're you know, in a foster home or they're going from foster home to foster home. They're looking for that love and affection, and that person sees that vulnerability and plays on it. Basic needs, acceptance, protection. They think it's glamorous, hope for a better future and success. Who are the traffickers? Sometimes I think people have a vision of who this trafficker looks like, what they look like, but these are all people who have been arrested for trafficking. So it could be pretty much anybody, male, female, race, any race or religion, US citizen, 
working individually or working together with others. This young, this um, the couple on the bottom right worked together at a, a domestic trafficking case with them. The religious leaders, diplomats, could be really anybody. It's a power and control wheel, which many of you are probably familiar with if you've done domestic violence work. So unfortunately, of many trafficking victims is one of intimidation, coercion, violence, loss of control over one's own health and safety, and many of the um, power and control dynamics in domestic violence are the same, which is makes it somehow recognize that trafficking too. So we're going to talk about coercion for a second. There's psychological coercion and psychological control. It's the easy to conceal and it's you know, often overlooked. These are some of the uh, coercion lists there, humiliation, alcohol and drugs, and then there's psychological control. How do they control that person? Creating dependence, legal threats. Isolation, big one. Many times they're, you know, threatened with deportation. forms of coercion will depend on the gender. Male victims most likely to be subjected to threats against family, withheld wages, confinement, denial of food and sleep, and threats of legal action and violence, uh, I'm sure too. Females, usually higher rates of sexual violence, more likely to have their passports or other documents withheld. This is um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which we'll talk about later again. I'm just going to go through this slide quickly, which is, um, you know, the vulnerabilities that people look for when they're looking for a trafficking victim. They work on all these different needs that person has. We're going to talk about that later again. <clears throat> so these are the questions that I want you to keep in mind when we're going through the case examples. So what factors made the victims vulnerable? And I'll remind you of them too, if you forget those. What means did the traffickers use to induce the victims to work? If you encountered one of these victims over the course of this situation, what factors might have suggested that she, he, they were being trafficked? And why do you think the victims didn't leave right away? So I don't know if we'll have time for all of the examples. I do have quite a few, but we'll, um, it makes it a little more interesting when you see actual examples of cases that have happened. Okay, so this is an El Monte, California sweatshop. <clears throat> There's 72 victims and 10 perpetrators. So I'm gonna uh, read a little summary of this case right here. Rachana, one of the 72 workers discovered in the sweatshop said she wanted to go to America so she could have a better life for herself and her children. So the recruiter was kind and generous, promising her a legitimate job that would enable her to quickly pay off the $4,800 loan she secured from the recruiter to pay for the plane ticket and processing fee to the United States. Once the plane touched down, the recruiters took the jewelry, their passports, and their money. They transported the workers to the El Monte complex, a row of two-story buildings with boarded up windows and a fence surrounding the entire compound, topped with barbed wire and spikes facing inward. Two guards armed with guns, knives, and baseball bats patrolled the building 24 hours a day. Their, 
Thai nationals were forced to sew clothing 17 to 22 hours a day. They were not allowed any contact with the outside world and their letters home were censored, opened and read to ensure no news of their captivity would reach home. They were not allowed breaks, even when sick or any social interactions with each other. They were under 24 seven surveillance by armed guards. Some were held against their will for as long as seven years. They were not paid as they had to work off their debt to their traffickers employers. <clears throat> In essence, they became indentured servants. However, they were forced to buy food and personal supplies such as toothpaste, shampoo at inflated prices from their employees residing at the complex who operated sundries and the garages. Having no money to make their purchases, these amounts for the rent and personal items would be tacked onto their debt. Their debt kept growing with no end in sight. <clears throat> so, is anybody writing anything in the uh, Not yet. Uh, <laughs> what made them vulnerable? And what means did the traffickers use to induce them to work? So they were literally trapped with armed guards and barbed wire and mm -hmm. they're imprisoned. Threatened. So what made them vulnerable? What were they looking for when they got into they, this situation? They were poor and wanted a better life. Right, exactly. And this is obvious, you know, why did the victims not leave right away? <clears throat> They, they literally couldn't, there was no way. They were afraid and they had nowhere to go. They didn't, even if they got away, where would they go? They had no passports, nothing. And completely trapped and dependent, mm -hmm. being held captive. So that's just one example, which is pretty horrifying. Um, I probably will not be able to go through all of them, but I'm going to give you a couple more examples. I think I'll go to the... <clears throat> so this is um, October 2002 to September 2007. The defendant, Afalabe, a successful textile merchant from Togo, led a criminal operation that used fraudulently obtained visas to traffic over 20 West African girls to the United States. The victims were between the ages of 10 and 19 years old. He used emotional physical abuse to force girls to work up to 14 hours a day at hair and nail salons in Newark and East Orange, New Jersey also have found to have abused, sexually abused the girls, confiscated the victim's identity documents, exploited the girls' cultural fear of voodoo curses to control and manipulate them. They um, imposed strict rules that they could not learn English or contact people outside their house. So this is the New Jersey. What were some of the ways that um, they kept them in the situation? And we see the common ways that, that people are kept in the situation out of fear. Isolating from family members. Exactly not being able to speak the English language. Like the fear of the voodoo curses, that's mm -hmm. strong. They use a culture. Uh, 
by the way, they were sentenced to 27 years in prison, found guilty of forced labor and visa fraud. Kathy, wouldn't, wouldn't customers question a girl that young working in the braiding salon? You know, I feel like, um, you know, sometimes we look at, at these places and think it's, you know, oh, you know, it's normalized kind of. Family the business. Way look at, you know, like I said earlier about the Chinese restaurants yeah. that I never even thought about, um, where I feel like I've seen young kids work in Chinese restaurants a lot. <laughs> um, and we kind of normalize it that it's, you know, it's okay, or it's a relative, you know, and they're just helping out or something like that. Aren't they cute? Yeah. Okay, so this is um, a resident of New York. His name is uh, Corey, da uh, Corey Davis, yeah. <clears throat> Pleaded guilty in a case involving the forced prostitution of minor and adult women in New York, Connecticut, and Texas. Forced girls as young as 12 to work as strippers, dancers, and prostitutes for up to 12 hours a day. After each shift, Davis confiscated all of the victim's earnings, when they weren't working, he confined them to a locked house in Queens, New York. To maintain control over the victims, repeatedly assaulted them. Who broke anybody who broke the house rules? In one instance, he a handgun in the girl's mouth. Pleaded guilty to one count of sex trafficking and was sentenced to over 24 years imprisonment. A fund for the victims was who created from his profits, by the way. I have a question in the chat. Do you know what the estimate is for percentage of traffickers who are not caught? Hmm. No, I do not. I could try to find that out. I don't know if there's a way of finding out if they're not caught, but you know, I can find out if, if there's anything out there that research shows. So this is an example of labor trafficking where this person was cognitively disabled and her child were recruited to live with the perpetrators. So these tactics that they used were um, threatening victims with pit bulls and snakes and causing them to sleep in unsafe, unsanitary condi uh, conditions, preventing them from eating regular and suitable meals, forced them to eat dog food and crawl on the floor while wearing a dog collar. That's according to uh, trial testimony. And this was in Ohio. And the perpetrators were two men and two women in this case. I believe they also threatened to um, report her. They took videos of her beating the child, forced her to beat the child and took videos of it and threatened her with that. They would call Child Protective Services. So what did they use to, what was the vulnerability that this person had? Well, because she was cognitively disabled, she probably wasn't able to mm -hmm. think clearly how to get her, get away out of this. Right, which is probably how she was recruited also. And the threats, how they kept her in it, and violence, 
and degrade, you know, degrading her by making her crawl on the floor while wearing a dog collar. <clears throat> the next one is a um, local case, Newburgh. Alexander Adams, you could look that up if you want to Google it, you'll see the um, whole the whole article. It's in New Windsor and Newburgh between 2009 and 2013. Had 10 women, homeless, hungry, and heroin addicts that isolated them in hotel rooms, threatened them with physical violence, and sometimes used a whip. And what were the vulnerabilities? Well, they probably withheld heroin from them mm -hmm. if they didn't comply. Right, and they were homeless. And how did they keep them, isolated them, physical violence, sometimes used a whip, threatening? So this is, you know, just to show you, you know, right around the corner here. Um, so it's happening everywhere. We go again, it's not moving. Okay. And this is a forced labor. This is in North Carolina, I believe. I'm trying to. Um, so this is mainly uh, force the victim to engage in various types of labor, including cleaning yards in the trailer park and cleaning the mobile home without being paid for his services. So this is a, a woman trafficker. The indictment also uh, alleged that she did not provide adequate food to the victim or allow him to visit his father. Threatened to report the victim to law enforcement and immigration officials. So they used the threats of immigration this person and withheld the birth certificate. So we have a post in the chat that's a link to some stats on USA Today. Mm -hmm. And Kathy, I'm wondering um, if you're going to talk at all about what what the qualities of the perpetrators are. I mean, what do they mm -hmm. kind of have in common? I don't really have that. Um, Seems like some pretty kind of sociopathic. Yes. Yeah, because some of the things that they do to people are so um, Who would think psychopathic. Of it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and obviously there's money behind it. You know, that's the main goal is to make money off of these people. This one. Uh, making men promise them attractive salaries. Um, you know, they lived in horrible living conditions, monitored every movement, uh, attack, you know, had them attacked by dogs. I think this is the one where, um, yeah, I think this one, one of the people got away and ended up reporting it. He escaped, and that's how this guy got caught. To maintain control, the verbal assaults, the threats, physical abuse. I don't think we'll have time for this, um, but I think it's an important video to watch. It's, um, her name is Rachel Thomas. So if you Google, if you go on YouTube, and Google Rachel Thomas um, trafficking. It's about 20, 25 minute video. And many times when I try to play videos on this, you can't hear it anyway. So I'm thinking it'll be better off if you try to do that on your own. But it's really, really uh, interesting video. And it's the person who was trafficked talking about her experience. So it's Rachel Thomas um, trafficking. I actually had my daughter watch it yesterday and her friends. Um, but it's, it, 
it's a good video to watch just to see how, you know, it's not always that runaway kid. Rachel Thomas was your everyday, you know, um, young woman who you'd see at, you know, Marist College possibly, you know, not somebody who was on the street or running away or anything like that. So it can happen to almost anybody. And that's kind of what this video shows. I have a friend who lives locally, who's a, just a housewife and mother. And mm -hmm. as a young adult, she was uh, hitchhiking uh, on her own. And she was held by a man in uh, Thailand for a number of years, kind of as a sex slave. And she, he ended up, he bought her some jewelry occasionally. And she ended up um, escaping with the jewelry and her passport and running for the airport. It was just an incredible, incredible story. And wow. you, would never, you, know, you would never know from meeting her that anything unusual had ever happened. Wow. <clears throat> Did she ever get help, that, like therapy? Um, she's pretty active in a spiritual community. So I would imagine that that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. This is just by kind of showing what I think the typical victim. Of. So here's some of the challenges. Um, most victims don't think they're being trafficked. Some of them distrust law enforcement already or service providers. Immigration, big one. They don't know about resources. They're trying to pay back that debt. And they move them around frequently. They're trained to tell lies. And, and they feel like they may be the one in trouble for what they're being forced to do because they're convinced by the trafficker that they can get in trouble for, you know, what they've been doing, such as, you know, prostituting or, you know, in that case where they made the mother beat her child. Fear of retaliation. They threaten their loved ones. And coping mechanisms. And you'll see that in the video, if you watch the video, the Rachel Thomas video about the um, threats to their loved ones was one of the things that they made. They're not a US citizen. It's many of the factors that will keep them in it. Undocumented. We had a case a few years ago where uh, the woman was um, working at a local Mexican restaurant and they were making her sign documents in English and she didn't understand the language, but they wouldn't provide her any documents in uh, Spanish. So um, they weren't paying her, they weren't paying other people who were working there, they were making threats. So that was another common one um, that was turned over to somebody else to work with. So I'm not sure what ended up happening, but you know, it was the red flags went off after talking to this young woman. So these are some of the um, trauma that human trafficking victims present with. PTSD, mood disorders, anxiety, panic attacks, man, uh, major depressive, dissociative, substance related disorders. And these are the coping mechanisms. It makes it difficult to sometimes identify people or assist them. Bonding to the trafficker is a big one. Many, many people present when they are convinced that this person loves them and they are totally bonded to that person and don't want to get them in trouble. So these kids are, you know, the kids that are, um, in these situations are often used to taking blame and taking ownership as a way to feel in control. So they, you know, say, oh, I wanted to do this or I, you know, 
I, I this is my plan. It's not somebody's not making me do this. And here's some statistics. Twenty-five percent running away from home, substance abuse high. So Dutchess County's uh, response come in three phases: immediate support, safety, medical, place to stay, short-term housing, mental health, legal, and then long-term education, training, employment, and obviously more mental health services. So the first, you know, immediate is like the first 24 to 72 hours. You want to get them in a safe place, get their basic needs taken care of. And then short term, maybe one to three months to get these started. It can be continued long term when necessary, like I said, with the mental health services. And then three plus ongoing. <clears throat> and here is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs again. So basically, bringing this up again. Um, the traffickers' goal is to destabilize all the lower rungs first. The physiological needs, safety and stability, love and belongingness, and then it goes up. It's kind of like uh, domestic violence in many ways, right? It's basically to break them down so they're more easily controlled. A question about who provides the services? Um, well, we have a human trafficking task force that um, is run through the county and different service providers. Courtney, who is actually, um, she has her own private practice, the person who um, created this training. She has her own private practice. I believe she works with mostly adults now, but she's worked with many trafficking victims, a trauma counselor, or anybody who is um, you know, working as trauma counselors would be able to provide these services. And um, the county, as far as uh, getting them stabilized, you know, sometimes working with the Center for Victim Safety and Support, the Rape Crisis Program, can help with many of these things too. It's kind of a, you know, takes a village situation where you want to get different service providers involved to help that person. You know, you want to get them stabilized housing, you want to have a, have a case manager, you want to get a mental health services. As far as under 18, uh, that is, uh, CPS gets involved right away. And sometimes these kids end up at the children's home in Poughkeepsie. Um, they provide a lot of uh, services for victims of trafficking. So, This is important, you know, we always want people to make their own choices, regardless of the circumstance. Let them know that someone's there to listen and you have to listen because many of these people come with um, a lot of mistrust of service providers, of law enforcement, et cetera. And, you know, you wanna give them back their control. It's like when we work with sexual assault victims, um, we want to always give them back their control to, of their situation and let them make decisions about what they want to do. Because in the past, they were never given a choice as human trafficking victims. So you don't want to take that control over. Then they're just being controlled by somebody else. And we have 
decisions. And even though, you know, we may not agree with it, um, we still have to give them the choice to make those decisions. So we use some of the choices, when to leave, where to live, whether or not to report, engage in services, receive mental health counseling, all those are their choice. And to make sure they have access to these things if they want them. This is um, something that uh, I think they're starting up again. It's a red tag um, project. And they will put these forms in different places in different buildings uh, this way it's kind of a discreet way of letting them know this is here and they just pull off the red tag and they can hand it to a staff member uh, say they're at department of social services and they hand that to a staff member and people are going to be trained on what to do if that happens and they they take them to a private place a social worker or somebody a case manager and um, works with that person. And this is in the uh, works right now, actually. And it's for domestic violence, trafficking, sex trafficking, labor. So Dutchess County response. Client displays indicators of human trafficking, speak with the client alone, utilize an interpreter if you have to. Using a trauma-informed approach, assess for safety concerns. We always think about safety first. Get that person in a safe space and screen for trafficking. If they're in danger or need immediate medical assistance, obviously we contact 911. If you suspect trafficking or would like to seek help for a potential victim, you can call the 24-hour crime victims hotline. And the number's right there, 452-7272, to connect them with other services. If they're under age 18, you have to call the 24-hour child abuse hotline. And if they need emergency mental health services, we have the helpline in Dutchess County, Stabilization Center, Mobile Crisis. Sheriff's Office um, is trained well in responding to trafficking victims, so that's usually the law enforcement agency that we contact. We have a county human trafficking uh, tracking form. If they are open to, um, you know, filling it out, it's confidential, um, but they also are open to getting more services from New York State. And what time is it? Um, okay. So, I don't know if we want to, do we want to try to watch that video? We'd rather watch it on your own. How long is it, Kathy? I want to say it's like 20, 25 minutes. So maybe I'll, I'll just leave it for everyone to watch on their own. Okay. I'm afraid it'll go over what they were planning on today. Right, okay. <clears throat> so here are the two hotlines, family services, that's Bosch. Does anybody have any questions they want to put in the chat box? I'll give you my email also. If you want to um, me to send you anything, you can email me. It's K Peluso, P E L U S O, at Family Services NY.org. Can you throw that in the chat box? I don't know why I don't have a chat box. Yes, I'll post it now. Okay. Oh, it just came up. Uh. Okay, I see. I just found the chat box. <laughs> Please, we have a comment. Please be okay. sure to send the PowerPoint so we have the link to the video. Thank oh, yeah. you. This was very helpful. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming, everyone.